We are a country divided. I really don't think I have to convince any of you that that is the case. Think about it. Just look at our world right now with COVID-19. There are some people who think COVID is, has that potential to kill millions upon millions of people. There are others who think COVID is nothing more maybe than the flu. We are divided on things like race right now. Some people think that racism is the single most important issue of our time, while others think America is the least racist country in the history of the world. And then if I mention our president, there's no telling how you or others might respond to that. We're divided over women's rights. We're divided over abortion, capitalism versus socialism, sexuality. We could go on and on and on, but I really think you get my point. Our country is at a war within itself. Have you ever thought about it? Our country is a really unique place. We have stood under one document for close to 250 years. Many major countries around the world change governments about as often as we change presidents. So it brings up an important question. What has made this country so special? Could it be that we are founded upon more than just a document? Maybe that it's more than just an idea, but that we are founded upon principles that are right and that are good. I want you to know that no matter what you read in the history book, that we live in a nation that began with God in mind. I want us to take a look over the next few minutes at where our country has been, where it was in its infancy. And I want to examine where we are right now. And I want to pose a question to you. What will happen if this nation no longer looks to God? Are we any different than other nations around the world? Are we any different than the nation of Israel? Are we any different than the Roman Empire who fell because they turned their back on everything that was right and that was good? So first I want to begin with a very simple proposition. That is that our country was founded upon biblical principles. If you look back at the 1600s, one of the reasons that the Puritans left England is because they felt the Church of England had become too much like the Catholic Church. They left with the idea of establishing a pure church in this brand new land that we call America. It does sound like God was pretty important to them, doesn't it? It's become a popular belief over the last 50 years or so that all of our founding fathers were atheists, agnostics, deists, but that just isn't true. Did you know that many of our founding fathers wrote tracts for the American Bible Society? Did you know that when the state constitutions were being ratified that it was actually a requirement that the states believed in God and the inspiration of the Bible? Did you know that these men felt so strongly about their biblical principles and ideas that portions of our government were completely based upon it? I think about the idea of the three branches of government. That came from Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22. The verse says, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. The judge represents the Supreme Court. The lawgiver represents Congress. And the king represented the president. The Bible was even known to be read and quoted on a regular basis on the floor of Congress the most quoted book, according to records, is the book of Deuteronomy. I wouldn't call that our light reading. These men knew their Bible, and they knew their Bible well. In 1811, in the court case, The People versus Ruggles, the court stated, and I quote, Whatever strikes at the root of Christianity tends manifestly to the dissolution of civil government. End quote. Regarding this case, there was an individual who spoke on the floor of Congress and he used profane language and was blasphemous. Congress then replied to him that if you attack Jesus, you have attacked Christianity. 
And if you have attacked Christianity, you have attacked the foundation of the United States of America. He was fined $500 in 1811 and sentenced to three months in prison. Can you imagine someone being thrown in jail today in 2020 for attacking Christianity? But that's actually what happened on the floor of Congress in 1811. My second point that I want to bring to you today is that the Bible was never questioned in our schools in the early days of the country. The New England Primer was our major textbook in our public schools going from 1690 all the way to 1900. In that Primer, it connected learning the alphabet with learning the Bible. It also asked questions like who was the first man, who was the first woman, and who was the first murderer. Even the law textbooks would contain Bible verses showing the verse on which certain laws were based. And in 1844, we had an argument start up in Philadelphia. The argument was that we should have morality in this country, but we should do so without Christianity. I don't know about you, but that argument sounds pretty familiar to me. The Supreme Court responded to that argument, by the way. The Supreme Court said, and I quote, why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as a divine revelation in our schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? Thomas Jefferson even said that Christianity is important because it, quote, is the only religion that deals with the heart, end quote. If you start with a heart, you see the other problems are automatically solved. Isn't that what Jesus was trying to say to us in the Sermon on the Mount? Adultery isn't committed if we don't lust. Murder isn't committed if we aren't angry with our brother. Those are basic Christian teachings. In Proverbs chapter 14 and 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's pretty clear that we were a nation that had righteous intentions and righteous motives. We were a nation that had God at the forefront of our minds. Our problems started to happen, though, when we no longer focused on solving our problems on the inside of the heart. It began with several Supreme Court rulings that took place. Lawsuits attempting to ban anything to do with God or morality began to be accepted around the 1960s. And I think we are seeing a result of a nation that is beginning to turn its back on God. In 1962, in Engel versus Vitell, prayer was removed from public schools. On June 17th, 1963, in the court case Abington versus Shemp, the Bible was taken out of our public schools, and the reason for taking the Bible out of public schools is quite interesting. According to the quote, it was, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the child, end quote. So within a 12-month period... We completely removed prayer, we completely removed Bible reading, and we completely removed Bible classes from our public schools. So let me throw an interesting stat at you. In 1963, 97% of Americans claimed to believe in God. So that means that our Supreme Court sided with 3% in effect, making the 3% the majority. The philosophy of 3% now ruled our land. But it didn't just stop there, as we all know. In 1965, it became unconstitutional for a student to pray out loud. In 1967, it was said that a certain nursery rhyme was deemed unconstitutional because it might cause someone to think about God. And in 1980, referring to a posted copy of the Ten Commandments, it said, quote, If the posted copy of the Ten Commandments are to have an effect at all, it will be to induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps to venerate and even obey the commandments. This is not a permissible objective, end quote. 
According to our Supreme Court, we now should not teach our children to steal, kill, or commit adultery. We shouldn't teach them there's only one God and that there's nothing more important than Him. So I ask, is there any wonder our country is in the shape that it's currently in? I mean, you do realize that if the Ten Commandments had been written by Plato or Aristotle or someone like that, that they would be allowed. But simply because they are from the Bible, they are not. I think about what the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I'll say it again. In 1963, 97% of all Americans claim to be Christian. But in the last 50 years, those numbers have dropped dramatically. Now about 80% of Americans claim to be Christian. 9% claim to be atheist and agnostic. And 11% identify with another religion. That is a change of 17% in the span of about a generation and a half. But here's the thing, that 80% number is quite high because the reality is even among that 80%, about one-third of those that claim to be Christian say that Jesus is not really the Son of God. So based upon that very simple basic test, those really wouldn't be Christians either. Now here's the thing. As we continue down this path, things have gotten worse. Since we began taking God out of our government, we have created numerous problems for ourselves. Since prayer was taken out of school in 1963, let me give you a few results that we have seen. Teen pregnancies increased by 550%. STDs increased 225%. Divorce increased 117% when the 15 years prior to 1963, it had actually gone down. Single-parent homes have increased 140%. Cohabitating couples have increased 350%, and that number is skyrocketing daily. Violent crimes increased 544%, and SAT scores dropped over 80 points on the average. That number, by the way, was stable between 1926 and 1963. What's interesting is in the 1974-75 school year, SAT scores actually took a slightward tick up. That would be the year when private Christian schools exploded in this nation. And according to SAT, scores out of private Christian schools are about 100 points higher on the average And this would put scores at basically the same place they were prior to 1963, before prayer and Bible reading were taken out of our public schools. So I think this brings up an important question. What is the fundamental difference between public schools and private schools? Well, for the most part, especially if we're talking about those Christian private schools, They all study the same English text. They all study the same math, the same history, the same geography. Really, the only difference is biblical and Christian principles are being taught to them on a daily basis. We as Americans always want to be number one, and that's a good thing. And we are number one in a lot of places we wouldn't want to be. We are number one in the world in violence, in crime, in divorce, involuntary abortions, and illegal drugs. We are number one in the world when it comes in the Western world, when it comes to teen pregnancies and illiteracy. And is there any wonder that other nations in the world view us as evil? We claim to be a Christian nation, but I think it's pretty clear we don't act like one. In Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, Isaiah says, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes and cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's case. Come now, let us reason together, 
says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Finally, my last point for the lesson, we have to do something or we will fall. I think about the fall of Rome. You know, my wife and I love going to Italy. We've been to Rome a couple of times and I love looking at the history of the Roman Empire. Many scholars will tell you there are five major reasons that the Roman Empire fell. The rapid increase of divorce, higher taxes, a mad craze for pleasure, giant armies to fight the enemy when the real enemy was within themselves, and the decay of religion. Do any of those sound familiar? Because I think they do. You know, you look back, and it seems clear to me we have been robbed of our freedoms by a 3% minority. And that 3% minority is now 20 plus percent. And I wonder, do we need to try to get back what we've given up? Abraham Lincoln was asked during the Civil War if he believed God was on the Union side. President Lincoln responded by saying, quote, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My great concern is to be on God's side, end quote. I think about Acts chapter 17. For some reason, Acts 17, 6 has always been one of my favorite verses, although it's not one we talk about a lot. And in it, it says, And when they cannot find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. I love studying about the apostles in their lives. And I've often wondered how 12 men could upset the world. They were able to upset the world, I think, simply because they believed in something greater than themselves. They believed that no matter what happened to them, that it was worth it for them to stand up for what they knew to be right. I think we need to remember that it is our responsibility as Christians to stand up for what we believe in. We live in a nation where at least to this point, we've been given that freedom to stand up for what we believe in without persecution, a luxury that the vast majority of the world to this day does not have. And chances are we will never be killed for our beliefs. Chances are we really won't face severe persecution. So why do we not stand up for it? I think about the fact that the media has even coined us the silent majority. The silent majority. That's because we don't speak up for what we believe in. If we don't stand up for Christ now, I really do believe there is a day coming where those freedoms are going to be taken away from us. If you don't believe that day could come, just look at other countries around the world. Look at Canada, our neighbor to the north. It is illegal to speak against homosexuality in Canada. If you preach against homosexuality in Canada, you can and will be jailed for it because it is considered discrimination by the Canadian Parliament. I mean, do I really need to ask you how long do you think that's going to be before that happens here? Because I don't think it's long at all if we don't stand up and take a stand for what we believe in. I am convinced we can make an impact. I am convinced that we can upset the world just like the apostles, but we really truly have to believe in something that is bigger than ourselves. Just imagine the impact that 80% or so of the nation could have if they just stood up and said, we believe in God and we're not going to let you push us around. 
I am convinced if we stood up, we could change a lot of these things that are happening. I'm convinced of it, fully convinced of it. And if you don't believe you can make a difference, I, I found this story, it's a little dated, but it's from June 1st, 2006, and it was titled, They Wouldn't Be Silenced. And I'll just read you just a little from the story. It says, at the Russell County, Kentucky High School graduation last Friday night, about 200 seniors spontaneously stood and began reciting the Lord's Prayer, prompting a thunderous standing ovation from the standing room only crowd. They were protesting Judge Joseph H. McKinley Jr.'s court order issued just hours before, barring a member of the senior class from praying at graduation. Only days before the graduation, the ACLU of Kentucky filed suit, asking the court to issue an emergency order to block the prayer. The court complied, trampling the student's right to free speech, end quote. But the over 200 seniors of Russell County High School decided that they weren't going to take it, and they broke the court order, standing and praying at their graduation, with the entire auditorium standing up with them and thundering in applause. Second Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Matthew chapter 5 and 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So I simply end with this question. Are we being the salt of the world? Are we being a light set upon a hill? Or are we helping and allowing a 20% minority to become the majority by remaining silent? Thank you. Hey, Ryan. Uh, Glad to have you here with us today. Did that feel authentic? (laughs) It did. Okay, good. (laughs) That was good. Uh, So we're pretty excited that you could be here for the the Bible series and appreciate what you've done in teaching the lesson, the research you've done, especially giving us your time. Really excited about having this Q&A time as well to follow up with some of the information. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what you talked about with us today was how did we get here and covering a lot of the topics that, you know, I I know people are concerned about. How do we get from a point where in the past we do have a sense of an idealized past of America of what it was and, um, and we feel like there is some sort of detachment from that. At the same time, there's a lot of division in our country. Absolutely. There's a lot of concern for that. So kind of jumping in that for a little bit, um, what can we do uh, to kind of help understand and to turn that trend uh, we have where people seem to be drifting away from God? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. And you know, the first thing I always think about is turning inward and looking at ourselves. I mean, I, I do therapy for a living. And so therefore that's kind of, you know, one of the things that I always focus on. And when you, when you look at what's happening in our country, I'm, I'm fearful that we aren't doing a good job in our actual homes. As far as parents not really teaching their children at home, there, there seems to be an attitude a lot of times of it's, well, let the youth minister do it. Let the church do it. You know, as long as I'm taking my kid to church three times a week, we're good. Right. Um, and research actually shows that's not the case at all. As a matter of fact, Christians who remain faithful throughout life typically have very strong Christian homes. And, and one of the things that really stands out is a study Barna did. Barna did a study several years ago that said uh, if we look at non-Christian homes and Christian homes, they're almost indistinguishable. 
Uh, Christian homes typically will pray maybe at a meal or something like that, but they didn't see any more prayer in Christian homes. They didn't see any more Bible study in Christian homes. They didn't see any more talking about topics among right. themselves at the dinner table at home. So there were those kinds of things that weren't happening at home. And that's a hot topic because I think we would typically assume that because we're Christians in our Christian homes, these practices would be the norm Yeah, and they're not really the norm. In fact, it's it's sometimes more shocking in a good way when you hear someone say, yeah, we do a Devo every night yep. uh, with their family Absolutely. or we uh, certainly pray before every meal. And you obviously start noticing this when you go out to eat at restaurants. Don't have to be in the home. Right. I'll, you'll see it in the restaurants. You um, will. And you're like, OK. Well, and it kind of it kind of reminds me of that. I get talking about doing it at home is Bible topics being discussed, having conversation. You know, we were talking right before we started that kids go off to college and they they see and hear things that they've never heard about before. True, you know, it's shocking true. to me. I will have college students because I've taught an evidences class at church come to me about Christian evidences. They will come to me about, you know, I've got a professor who's telling me the earth is six billion years old, but I, I know the Bible doesn't say that, but I have no idea how to handle that. And you're going, you're in college and you've never discussed Genesis chapter one. Are you kidding me? Right. You know, those kinds of things that are really uh, amazing. I think the interesting thing about a couple interesting things about that is one, I'm so glad that they see you as a person they could go and talk to about that. Sure, so yeah. to have that there uh, was really important. Um, for me, that was really the elders when I, when I grew up, yeah. uh, that sure. would always picture them in my head. How would they handle the situation? So having that's really important, but you know, kind of what we were talking about, why they should go to mom and dad first. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do we equip mom and dad to be able to handle those situations? Yeah. Well, and, and I don't, I don't mean this critical towards anybody at all, but I, you know, I had somebody tell me one time, uh, why would we talk about something about the age of the earth at church? I mean, that has nothing to do with, right. and, 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 and you just kind of think you've got to understand the issues that our children are dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, they're dealing with, you know, research actually shows, and I, I didn't necessarily mean to get on this particular topic, but research shows that kids struggle more with Genesis chapter one. They struggle more with, you know, age of the earth and how God created things. And because when they go to their, to their first science class or first, you know, uh, a professor that's an atheist and he's hammering that home, they, you know, for them, that's huge because he's cracking away at their faith. And if they don't have training in that area and a lot of parents just think it's not important. Right. Um, like I said, I've, I've literally had more than one person tell me that, well, that doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. The and parents told you. Yeah, that. the parent told me that. Oh. It has nothing to do with and you go, well, absolutely it does. If it's pulling your child away, it absolutely has to do with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially since Jesus was the creator. Absolutely. Jesus referenced these things. So that's mm. super important. So yeah. it sounds to me like at some point parents have just got to accept that there's a responsibility sure. there and also come to terms with the reality of what's going on. And there. if they don't know, yeah, and I agree hundred percent, they've got to know the realities of what challenges the kids are facing and they can ask, they can talk to their kids. Where are you scared of? Where are you struggling? Where is your faith bad? You mm -hmm. know, that's one thing that I feel happens all the time is kids aren't comfortable talking about, well, I don't know if I believe in God. Right. You know, I don't know if it, because, you know, they, they just don't feel that comfort of bringing those topics right. up because a lot of times the environment is set up of you, you better believe, don't you dare not have faith, right? you know? And so we need to encourage questions. We need to encourage, uh, where are your doubts? Where are you struggling? What are the things that, you know, when you go off to school, uh, wh where are you really having your faith challenged right now? I think there's a. A shift. We talked about the shift because mm -hmm. your topic was how did we get here? Yeah. And there was a point, at least in our minds, and I'd like for you to discuss for a little bit here. And you, you covered it in your lesson, but just to kind of come back to this, did it always, was it always that way in America? Was there always a sense that there was a disconnect and there was this tension and, and real struggle with these kind of topics? Mm -hmm. um, part of us wants to feel like probably not. Mm -hmm. But is that very, is that, can we quantify that? You, you know, I don't know if we can quantify it, but, but the one, the, the first stat that comes to my mind that I mentioned in the lesson is 97% of people claimed to be Christian in, in the early sixties. Sure. So there seems to be a huge shift that has taken 
place since that point. Uh, most surveys now will put that number somewhere in the 80 ish percent. I sure. mean, you know, give or take, you, right. you know, depending on how they ask the question and, and what, you know, what the ins and outs of it are, you, you get somewhere in the 80 percent range. Um, what I find fascinating, though, is I kind of mentioned in my lesson, and I actually saw a stat this morning, which is, I guess, newer than even my lesson. Oh, super but, fresh. Yeah, super fresh. And it said that one third of, of Christians don't even believe that Jesus was the son of God, which is you, you just step back and go like, right. How is that even possible? You know, because so that's what, the foundation of what Jesus are they trying to follow there? There's a lot absolutely. of questions that come out of that. And, you know, and there, there's a sure. lot of a lot of ways we could take that. But when you have 80 percent of people claiming to be Christian, I would argue that within that 80 percent, I mean, if that statistic is right now, you've got a third of that mm -hmm. that doesn't even believe Jesus is the son of God, that right. he's a great teacher. Right. And so, you know, I would say that that 80 percent is not really 80 percent. Sure. You know, it's it's less than that. By far. Yeah. Um, and so in America, I know where I grew up, it was very, very religious. Mm -hmm. We had public schools, but the preachers would come and speak to our public schools, mm -hmm. right? I had to do lessons on Bible verses in right. a public school. Yeah. Everyone just assumed somebody else went to church. That was the assumption. Yeah. Now I hear cousins and whatever say church isn't that necessary. Right. Um, how did that come to be? Well, it's a, it's a great question. And I mean, I do think it goes a little bit back to this just cultural changing attitude and, 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 and maybe this is oversimplifying it, but I mean, I think, I think there's a love of the world. We get so overly concerned with what everybody else thinks and believes and feels. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, this is something I'm sure we'll talk about more in another, in another time, but, um, I think about social media. I mean, we're so wrapped up in everybody else's world. And what everybody else thinks and what everybody else believes. And Our whatever. perception of yeah. their lives. And it's almost like we've lost ourselves because we're so overly concerned with everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a loss of, of like just being grounded in who we are and what we believe. Yeah, really treasuring the identity of being a Christian. Yeah. Seems to have diminished. Yeah. Like it used to, of course, I'm a Christian. And that was something to hold in high regard. Mm -hmm. And now people yeah. seem to... That's a quieter voice. Yeah. And it's so ironic to me that people, you know, do social media and Facebook and, and there's this kind of attitude of I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be me, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm going to really be my authentic real self. And then it seems like everybody's the same. It seems like groupthink is, well, is, is, is a bigger deal now than yeah. it's ever been. You social know? media is a curated experience. Oh, absolutely. Of, um, absolutely. And the beauty when you see the videos, uh, especially the uh, the big influencers do their videos showing how they made their videos and how they made their pictures mm -hmm. and, and then the reality. I love when they show the reality picture versus the edited. Absolutely. I love it's the that best. Too. It's the best because it shows the real disconnect there. Absolutely. And we'll definitely, I know with some of the other topics, we'll definitely get kind of more into social media too. Sure. We'll, we'll sure. definitely be talking about that. Well, Ryan, any other comments you'd like to say to wrap up this topic? Yeah, I actually, I, I, I kind of had a quote that I wanted to share yeah, in go. this lesson that I thought True. was really interesting. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Alex de Tocqueville. Uh, he was a French diplomat in the 1800s, and he wrote a, he wrote a, a book called A Democracy in America. Okay. And, and it, it's a fascinating, if you go back and actually read what he wrote, it's pretty incredible because he had this real view of we were headed where we are now, I think. He really understood that. But he said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. In her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. In her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power? America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Isn't that incredible? That's pretty incredible. And what year was that? That was in the 1800s, early 1800s. 1800s. Yeah. French, Frenchman. Yeah, Frenchman that came over and wanted to understand why America was so great. And he wrote all these things about that, especially that piece, Democracy in America. And it's if you read it now, it's pretty incredible. Uh, but he understood that we're great because of our righteousness. We're great because, you know, we believe in something good and bigger than ourselves. And if we stop that, we'll no longer be great. Yeah. And I think we're seeing the results of that. 
Well, I think when the families, the churches, the individuals take responsibility for doing that in a godly way, mm -hmm. we'll see something turn around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brian, thanks so much for being here with us. You bet. Enjoy All it. Right. We'll see you in a week or two or yeah. <laughs> the next interview. That's right. Thanks. Mm -hmm.